Okay. I think we're slowing down just a little bit. Um, we will probably have some more people join in and that's okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. We do have a, a full agenda today. So we wanna make the best use of our hour that we can. So next slide, please. Welcome to today's webinar. We're so excited to have you here. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to think about the HV bath. Um, I'm Heather Johnson, a data and CQI TA specialist with the TARP, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Next slide. Just a few housekeeping pieces before we dive into content today. To listen to the audio for today's webinar, we invite you to join via computer audio at the top of the screen or by phone if you prefer. We're recording today's session and the recording will be shared to the mall and on YouTube following the event. We encourage discussion and engagement in the content today, so please feel free to use the chat box. Next slide. Here's a high level view of what we'll be talking about today. First, we'll go over best practices for HB BAT data collection. Then we'll hear from the Texas awardee about their lessons learned. We'll talk about ways to put the HB BAT data to use and finally, we'll hear from the Louisiana awardee about lessons learned and HB BAT application ideas. Next slide. I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. First, from the McVitar team, we have Sally Baggett, TA specialist, and Julie Lees, HB BAT subject matter expert. From the Texas awardee team at the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, we have Catherine Sibley, Director of Research and Evaluation, and Jody Snee, the Division Administrator for Early Childhood Programs. And from the Louisiana team at the Louisiana Department of Health, Tiffany Hanford, Fiscal Compliance Officer, and Sud Susanna Boudreau, McPhee Program Manager. Thanks to all the speakers for agreeing to be here today and share with us. Next slide. Thank you. So what is the HV BAP? The full name is the Home Visiting Budget Assistance Tool. It's designed for use by McBee awardees and their LIAs to collect and report on home visiting program costs over a 12 month period. Data from the HB BAT can be used to help McBee awardees and LIAs monitor program operations, develop budgets, and estimate the financial impact of expanding services, conduct economic evaluations, and inform alternative funding strategies. Next slide. Beginning this year, HRSA is requiring reporting of Home Visiting Budget Assistance Tools, or HVBAT, data for one third of awardees each year, resulting in collection of data from all awardees over a three year time period. We know it's a little bit tricky with the cohort approach to get a handle on the reporting timeline, so we've detailed them for you here. Awardees in cohort one completed their first round of data collection on March 31st, 2022. Cohort two awardees will submit their first round of data on March 31st, 2023, and cohort three awardees will submit their first round of data on March 31st, 2023. Awardees should begin HVBAT data collection at the end of the corresponding fiscal year. So for cohort two awardees, you'll report March 31st next year on costs to implement home visiting in your state or territory accrued from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. If you want to use the federal fiscal year, or you can report on your state territory fiscal year, which for many awardees would be July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2022. Now I'd like to pass it over to Julie Lee to talk about the best practices for HB BAT data collection. Julie? Thanks, Heather. I'm happy to be able to share some best practices today that were gleaned from lessons learned from the first cohort of McBee awardees. So I just wanna start by thanking all of the cohort one awardees for all of your efforts to collect and submit and revise HVBAT data and for your patience as we work to develop and streamline processes. I also wanna encourage cohort one awardees to please add any ideas and suggestions for your colleagues in the chat as I go. Next slide. For all things HVBAT, we recommend planning early. While HVBAT data won't be collected until the fiscal year ends, it's important to assemble a team, develop processes, and review HVBAT resources well before data collection begins. 
So as you plan for HVBAT data collection and submission, you should consider staff time and resources needed both at the LIA and the awardee levels. At the LIA level, it will be helpful to have both programmatic and fiscal staff on board the HVBAT team. And at the awardee level, you'll also want programmatic and fiscal staff on your team, as well as a data person who can merge LIA data in Excel or Stata and do data checks prior to submission to HRSA. You can get a sense of the staff needed and the timeline for who might need to be involved in HVBAT User Guide Volume 1, and I'll talk more about that shortly. There are also some systematic changes you can make to facilitate HVBAT data collection. One potential change we suggest is revising LIA contracts to require HVBAT data submission, just as you would for submission of annual performance data. That may not be possible for cohort two awardees at this point, but you can consider making that change moving forward. We also recommend collecting cost data using the HVBAT annually, although HRSA only requires reporting every three years as Heather detailed. Annual collection will keep everyone in the practice of having to submit cost data and will make the process easier in the future. More frequent data collection can also be useful for awardee and LIA monitoring, budgeting, planning, and evaluation purposes. I've already mentioned the HVBAT user guide and um, just want to reiterate that it's important to start familiarizing yourself with the tool and supporting materials early. And these are all on the mall. Next slide. So here's a quick preview of what's available. You can access the tool, the user guide, accompanying appendices, recent frequently asked questions, and cohort assignments and due dates. There are also resources you can use with your LIAs, like webinar slides you can use to orient your LIAs to the HVBAT. There's some email language to accompany the HVBAT and some other things up there. If you have any questions about any of the resources or you have trouble accessing them, please reach out to your TARC TA team. We'd be happy to connect you. Next. It's also important to take some time early on to build well for HVBAT data collection among LIAs. One way you can do this is by providing a rationale for collecting cost data and sharing benefits of completing this task with LIAs. So for example, some benefits might include being able to use the HVBAP data for program planning and budgeting. LIAs would be able to understand what percent of their costs are going to overhead and infrastructure versus labor and training and so forth. And they may choose to allocate funds differently moving forward to best support their home visitors and the families served. LIAs can also use the data to build future budgets and collecting these data builds on capacity and organizational knowledge around cost collection and reporting. It may also be helpful to draw parallels to other budget activities that LIAs may already complete, such as expense reporting, and show how each of that data builds upon those. Finally, LIAs may also feel more comfortable with this process if you describe the support you as the awardee will provide. Next slide. And so we have some ideas for support here. Again, we'd love to hear ideas from cohort one awardees in the chat, so please feel free to jump in there. We suggest sharing the HVBAT materials I showed earlier with LIAs as early on as possible to give them time to review and be able to kind of process and ask questions. We recommend offering a training for LIAs at the beginning of the data collection process, kind of a kickoff. And then a second session might be beneficial as LIAs start completing the tool and have more questions. As I mentioned earlier, there are some slides you can build on for that initial training available on the mall. Some cohort Cohort 1 awardees also offered weekly office hours for the period of time during which LIAs were given to complete the HVBAT. It will also be important to identify someone or multiple people on your team, depending on how many LIAs you have, to be responsible for fielding HVBAT questions. As you're planning, you'll want to establish timelines for HVBAT completion, your reviews of LIAs HVBAT data, and LIA revisions and then share those timelines with LAs early so they have plenty of notice and can build, can plan time both to complete the tool and revisions. You'll also wanna build in enough time to account for multiple iterations with LAs and to allow LAs sufficient time to revise after your initial review. Again, in the user guide in volume one, we include a sample timeline for completing the HVBAT implementation and the link is here on the slide and we'll put it in the chat as well. 
It will also be important for you to develop a data quality check process that you complete when you receive LIA data. And there's guidance in the user guide about how to do data quality checks and what to look for, as well as a data quality checklist. And then you'll also want to do some quality checks after you aggregate your data across LAs to make sure there were no errors introduced in the aggregation and all of the numbers are reasonable. We hope to share a checklist this year for what reviewers will be looking for as they review your data. We have reviewers from um, the TARC team as well as HRSA reviewing. And that way you'll know what we're looking for and you'll be able to use that as you review after aggregation. You may also want to build in some time for regular check-ins with your TARC data and CQI taste specialist who can support you both as you develop your plan for reviews and revisions and also during the data collection and reporting process. Finally, as I mentioned before, although HRSA is only requiring submission every three years, you may want to consider implementing the HVBAT data collection process annually as a way to build capacity at the awardee and LIA levels and have access to the most recent data for monitoring, planning, and other purposes. I'm now happy to pass it on to the Texas team. Thanks, Julie. I'm Jody Snee once again, and I have Catherine Sibley here with me to talk about our experience rolling out the HVBAT and the process that we used here in Texas. Um, so first, we just wanted to review our general approach that we used here in our state. All right, so here in Texas, we knew that HVBAT completion would be a pretty large undertaking. Um, this is really due to the number of LIAs that we have. Um, and for just a little context, we currently have 13 LIAs with 15 grants. All but two of these have multiple sub-awardees um, who provide the direct services. Um, and across the state, we have five different EVP home visiting models in use. So we knew from the outset that there would be a lot to navigate um, with the HVBAT and a lot of different partners that we'd need to be coordinating with along the way. So we really started with that end goal in mind. Uh, we definitely had to consider the overall time frame um, and what the competing priorities were for our state team, as well as for our LIAs across the state and their sub awardees, um, because ultimately they would be the ones um, compiling the information for each of the individual HVBAT tools. We also considered the length of time needed to provide instruction to the LIAs um, the number of LIAs and the individual providers that would be completing those tools. As I said, it's, um, it's a pretty hefty combination that we're working with here in Texas. We also consider the internal processing of the submitted tools and the time that we'd need to QA and aggregate that data for the state submission. And so with all of that said, um, and sort of the scope of that project, Communication was really key here in Texas. Um, we started off by explaining the purpose to all of our internal staff and to the LIAs. Um, we did express um, and communicate clearly to the LIAs and to um, the sub awardees who attended our webinar um, that this is really a HRSA requirement intended to establish um, more holistic and systemic understanding um, for those real costs of home visiting. Um, that this could be used um, for future information and reference. We let LIAs know that this was definitely not an audit um, review of their budgets or their agencies. Um, it wasn't an audit being conducted by HRSA or by our agency, DFPS. Um, we also let them know that the data would not be used in any way that would negatively impact their grant um, or for direct or immediate uh, grant planning purposes. Um, last, we really emphasized partnership. Um, we did our best to sort of learn and train on the tool and anticipate and address um, the questions that we'd be getting. Um, but we were still learning and let the LIAs know that we were committed to working through their questions, our questions together throughout the process. Um, I think that that collaborative approach really, um, it helped a lot in terms of um, kind of staying in constant communication with our LIAs along the way. 
Um, and since this was new, we also went in knowing that we wanted to set reasonable expectations. Um, we asked LIAs to do their best to complete the tools um, and provide accurate data while also acknowledging that they had other competing priorities within the required time frame um, that we had to complete the HVBAT. Um, and we also established an additional round of corrections and then sort of a good enough threshold at the end in order to submit all of the data by the required deadlines. So our timeline in Texas um, initially included six weeks for planning, eight weeks for LIA tool completion, and then six weeks for follow-up um, along with that QA and data compilation. Our planning period included internal training for our state team um, which in meant fully reviewing and getting additional TA on the instructions um, and making sure the instructions were ready for our LIAs, um, that they could be fully um, digested and understood by our LIAs. Um, and then preparing the individual tool files for all of the LIAs and the sub-awardees to be able to complete. Uh, due to the holidays um, and the simultaneous procurement that we were conducting, we allowed eight weeks for LIA completion of the HVBAT tools. Um, we hosted a training webinar and followed that up with two office hour style TA calls during the period that they were all working on completing their tools. Um, those office hours, I think Julie mentioned, they were extremely helpful for the grantees. Each of our grantees was working at sort of a different pace and had different needs along the way, um, different experiences within their own agencies that kind of um, kept their questions really specific. And some of them were able to bring their financial administrators and financial staff to the office hours um, to ask more detailed questions. So those were really helpful. Um, in the final six weeks, we reviewed all of the, um, the LIA submissions for completion, and we were able to request some missing information and some uh, corrections in that process. Uh, and then we completed the, um, the data compilation. We could have used more time to plan and get to know the tool ourselves, I think, um, before training our LIAs. Um, but we are hopeful that the next round of awardees kind of are in a better position and will have more lead time. Um, and certainly this call will, will help with that as well. All right. And just to walk through a couple general elements of our process that we used, we initially compressed the time for LIAs to complete their respective HVBAT tools, um, really to maintain a focus on completion, lend some urgency with that do your best um, message initially. Uh, our rollout was December 1st for our LIAs to get started on completing their individual HVBAT tools. Um, so the LIAs were really working on those tools over kind of the winter holidays and also while responding to our own procurement. And so we had to account for some time there. Um, we did pre-fill um, with uh, some minimal performance data, um, but really uh, largely passed on the HVBAT tools for LIAs to complete. We initially thought that we could pre-fill more of their data um, from our reporting system and also from uh, their billing submission, um, but really capturing the cost more holistically and sort of in the detailed way that the HVBAT requires meant that we didn't have a full picture, even with all of um, sort of the budget submissions and the billing submissions that we had on hand. Um, so we really needed the LIAs in most cases to provide those specifics um, and really at the sub-awardee level in many cases. Um, and so even our LIAs really needed um, the sub-awardees to complete those individual tools. Our process uh, did require separate HVBATs for um, each of the evidence-based models that were being used, including Family Connects. Um, the majority of our LIAs completed multiple tools. So here we had 36 tools total that, um, that the, our LIAs completed across the state um, and that we collected and then aggregated the data for. Um, 
The LAs themselves had each of their subawardees I mentioned um, complete their respective tools. For instance, for a local nonprofit operating the hippie program as a subawardee, the LIA had that agency complete the tool for their funded hippie programming and so on. And so we really did have a lot of communication along the way with not just the LIAs, but also doing some um, advising and guidance for um, subawardees um, and their respective staff members. Uh, we conducted QA once all of the data was in. Um, we were asking ourselves if things seemed correct across the models or across sites um, from what we know from their billing submissions um, and their staffing, um, their staffing plans that we had on hand. Um, we reviewed the outliers, missing data, and then some unexpected responses. Um, we definitely could have used more time uh, to review and reach back out once the HB bat tools came in from the LIAs. Um, building in more time was definitely the right call on the front end, but um, we were unfortunately short staffed and launching ARPA um, as well as that new procurement. So we're not fully able to capitalize on um, kind of that stage or that phase. So we ultimately needed more time for tool review and um, quality assurance for the data that was submitted. Um, really, uh, because we have so many different LIAs, um, so many different types of agencies that operate programs here in Texas, um, we had a number of agencies that found ways to interpret the tool um, that we hadn't yet considered, partic particularly on that um, labor cost tab. Um, we would likely reduce the time for completion and increase the time for follow-up as that would allow for that more precise workshopping um, and guidance and kind of more systematic approach to corrections. Um, and then had we had additional time during the QA stage, we would likely have caught more of um, those mistakes um, that HRSA identified later and could have consulted more with HRSA about some of the labor tab anomalies that we were seeing. Um, and again, that was due to so many different combinations of providers and models. Um, and so they just had really unique experiences and found really unique ways of completing that labor cost tab. Um, we did learn a lot uh, through that feedback process with HRSA and developed kind of a better understanding of how we could then in turn advise and guide LIAs. Um, and so again, I think next time we will probably allow for more time in that, that last stage. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine to talk more broadly about some of the lessons learned um, in our overall process. Um, and she can tell she can tell everyone a little bit more about kind of um, the the beginning to the end about those lessons learned. For sure, I think some things we just wanted to wrap up with for you is really what were some really helpful things for us is one designating a project manager, someone that can help bring together the different teams, especially for us. That's bringing together program folks and contract folks and our data team. So having a project manager that can help facilitate all of that. I cannot emphasize enough about reading and rereading and rereading the guides and using your TA specialist. Um, it, it's a lot of information coming in um, to the various uh, documents that you'll be filling out. And so the more that you understand what is being captured and even the why behind what is being captured, the easier it is to turn around and talk to an LA and explain what it is that you're trying to collect from them. I think that is really something that'd be quite helpful on our next go round is really being able to explain a little bit more about what we're looking for, especially as Jody mentioned on that labor cost tab. It's really interesting when you have a part time employee who's working on a program such as like hippie that may not be fully staffed year round, who's also um, highlighting and, and doing some other work across different types of evidence based models so that labor cost can get really tricky and is really a great place to spend a lot more focus in kind of that training um, piece for your LIA itself. I think the other thing, as Jody mentioned, is leaving time for that back and forth quality checks. There's just so many documents going on and so many information pieces that it's really helpful to have extra time for that. I think the other thing that's important here 
is also it's it's kind of like learning math in elementary school. You you always have to learn the basics and how you can do it by hand versus a calculator, because then it lets you know, hey, something seems off if I know what that looks like. And same thing for here in that quality checks. There's one level of did we answer the question, but then does that question, does that answer make sense to that question? For us in Texas, we also, as a state, carry some of the costs for our LIAs. And then because we have some lead agency models, also making sure that that's getting incorporated into the HVVAT itself, um, since sometimes there are those costs um, elsewhere. I think lastly, though, is um, really encouraging LIAs to think through costs holistically. We did find this as a really helpful kind of exercise in the end, because we were gearing up for a new procurement. And so I think it really helped us um, and our allies think through what does it look like to cost programmatically? What does it look like to have um, model fees that are going into it? What sort of positions are really helpful beyond just the direct service provider um, and home visitor um, mode? So who else is that that really helps support this program overall? And how does that look like? So we really use this in a way at the end, our LIAs are are really um, used as they started thinking through proposals for the next year's um, grant cycle. And so I do think that's a really helpful tool. But I think for us, a lot of the work and the next time that we get to go through it will be much more about how do you set this up and train LAs so that way you don't have as much back and forth, but if you do that, there's plenty of time for it. So that's the Texas version of our uh, experience with the HVBAT. We'll pass it over to our good friends over in Louisiana, our neighbors, um, for what's next and how they worked on it. Thank you, Jody and Catherine. That was an excellent example of lessons learned and helpful information. So as we think further with you today about how you might use your HVBAT data, I'm gonna encourage you to use the chat feature and let us know how you are thinking about using the data to serve your purposes. So even if you don't know specifically, go ahead and give us some of your ideas in the chat. Let us see what you're thinking. Of course, we know that data use is going to vary depending on your state or territory priorities and your needs. Today, we're gonna to review some options to consider and hopefully we will spark some ideas that have relevance for your work. So let's move to our next slide. Program planning and subrecipient monitoring might be enhanced using the cost metrics from the HVBAT. For example, HVBAT data analysis can indicate which cost categories have the highest or the lowest spending levels. For example, is it labor? Is it training? Is it supplies? And that data can be used to analyze how and why costs may vary across your local implementing agencies. This information can then be used to identify LIAs that have higher or lower than average cost for specific cost categories. And it might help you understand program factors that contribute to this and whether they need to be addressed. So for example, if the range for training cost among your LIAs range from zero to 3% of their budgets, and you have an LIA who's spending closer to 10% of their budget on training, you might wanna flag this and have some conversation, look at it to determine if this is a reasonable cost, or are there things going on that might warrant further assistance with your LIA? So for example, are staff turnover rates driving higher training cost? And if so, you might be able to offer some conversations, some follow-up or some technical assistance with that LIA to help them reduce their staff attrition. Cost analysis can also prompt exploration of different efficiencies. So are there things to consider around professional development like using free training modules or platforms? Are there train the trainer opportunities that you might consider? Providing more detailed information about implementation and cost may also help inform questions of equity that can be considered in your efforts to ensure equal access to high quality home visitation services. And finally, labor cost and comparisons could provide you some momentum 
towards increasing home visitor pay, which we know is of great concern. And you might even consider establishing a minimum salary floor. Let's move to our next slide for more ideas. The HV bag can be used as awardees develop program budgets, identify trends in the average cost per family served, and estimate the financial impact of expanding services to more families or households. So when you're determining budgets for new LIAs, you may want to consider variables across different types of sites. Costs may vary, as you know, due to the program model selected, whether the agency is brand new to home visiting or the model that you plan to fund. And, and in that case, they may have startup expenses like core training. Or if the agency has been implementing the model and been running home visiting services and is only new to McV funding, you may have different expenses to consider. Organizational settings can also impact cost. Are your LIAs in rural or urban settings? What type of organization are they in? Is the structure hospital-based, school-based, or community-based? And that may need consideration. Again, I'm going to mention that HVBAT data can serve to improve equitable and transparent funding allocation processes. At a less intensive level, you might use your data of consum about consumable supplies to help you identify opportunities for cost sharing or bulk purchasing. If you analyze the program activity, that could help you assess and identify opportunities for infrastructure supports like additional outreach or additional CQI. Or it might help you analyze uh, transportation costs that could be helpful to support justification and planning for hybrid models of home visiting using both in-person and virtual home visits. Next slide, please. When linking your HVBAT data with your program outcomes, that data can inform economic evaluations. These evaluations could compare program costs to benefit. You could even tailor those to specific partners. Do you need that for federal government? Do you want to use it for information with your state government, your legislators, or do you want to use it as you inform your community and families? The HVBAT user guide has guidance and cautions related to interpretation and dissemination of results. And I'm gonna refer you back to those documents for more information, very important information. But as you know, understanding associations between implementation, cost and quality can be critical. For example, higher costs are not unnecessarily undesirable if they lead to greater benefits. So knowing whether the expense of reflective supervision for home visitors and for supervisors actually improves the quality of the services is, is key. Do wealth, wellness or mindfulness activities increase staff retention? Does dedicated time or infrastructure for outreach improve and increase your caseload capacity and enhance equity for access to home visits? These evaluations can also be very important for sustainability. What's the long-term investment, the short-term return on investment for your home visiting program? So our final slide addresses how you might also use this data for alternative funding strategies. HVBAT could inform the feasibility of these alternative payment approaches for home visiting services using Medicaid financing or pay for outcome approaches. They could be used to help support the development of unit cost or rates for Medicaid billing for home visiting. Some awardees may find that they can use them to determine cost and rates for partnerships through the Family First Prevention Services Act. And we know that they can support feasibility studies for expansion with pay for outcome projects. Documenting how much it costs to provide home visiting services per family in your state or territory, and using that data to estimate how many programs could be realistically funded is an important step in feasibility studies. So again, give us your ideas in the chat. If you've heard anything you're interested in, let us know. 
And now I'm gonna turn it over to Susanna and Tiffany from the Louisiana McVie Awardee. Good afternoon, everybody. Susanna Boudreau here from uh, Louisiana McVie and I have my colleague here with me today, also Tiffany Hanford, our fiscal compliance officer. And we just wanted to share a few lessons learned from going through uh, cohort one of the HVBAT data collection process. Um, one lesson learned from going through this process is that it helps to start with the end in mind. Next slide. We engaged our uh, fiscal representative, Tiffany, in the process from the very beginning and her involvement was key to our completion of this requirement. In Louisiana, the McB structure is set up in such a way that our fiscal representative uh, works very closely with our program and having her involved in the data collection process really allowed us to be proactive rather than reactive throughout the entire process. Her knowledge of the breadth and depth of the data points that were going to be uh, needed to be collected allowed us to just really anticipate needs and act um, proactively, certainly, uh, than reactively. Another thing that we learned is that simply completing the HVBAT data collection tool may not provide enough information to be useful in and of itself. We found that we needed to tailor the process and detail out some of the categories further in order to make the data useful to us. Um, for example, in our HVBAT submission, a majority of our costs were in contracted services. But in order to figure out what all was included in that category, we broke those costs down further for our own purposes so that we could then make informed decisions based on those data. And I'll let Tiffany share a little bit more about that. Okay, thanks, Susanna. Uh, here's an example of how we tailored the HVBET request to meet our needs. Um, for Louisiana McB, approximately 88% of all staff is hired through a contract agency. This includes our family support coaches who are our nurse home visitors and parent educators, our admin staff, outreach, among others. Um, so going through this HVBAT exercise, we quickly realized that by placing all the salaries and related benefits for those McVie contract staff together on the Contracted Services tab, we were unable to accurately determine the cost and funding sources of direct service personnel used to implement the McVie program. Looking at this chart, um, you would assume that 75% of McVee funding is used for contracted services, whereas only 20% is being used for our actual service delivery. Since the majority of the service delivery staff costs are included under contracted services, and only staff employed through the state of Louisiana is employed, I'm sorry, is included with the labor cost tab, this is not accurate. It was important for us to separate these costs to get a better picture of we're actually uh, dedicating funds to. Next slide, please. All right, so to allow us to make informed decisions based on the data we collected, we decided to drill down a little further and break out those costs under contracted services. In doing this, we found that 96% of all funding was used for staffing as opposed to the previous 88% um, when everything was listed together. Based on this data, we decided to list out the contract staff on the labor cost tab so that we can better identify one, costs to implement our program. Number two, those costs broken down by model, team, even down to the staff level. And finally, costs broken out by the actual funding source of those staff members. This will also help us to correctly identify the percentage of staff dedicated to service delivery as opposed to those executive and administrative tasks. Overall, this exercise was very vital in helping us to rethink how we process our, our data here in Louisiana. And reflecting back on completing the HVBAT data collection process, I would say that the requirement opened up the door for us to have what potentially could have been difficult conversations with our LIAs in a way that was more neutral and collaborative, um, one that didn't appear that we were digging around in their files. Um, because this requirement was coming from HRSA, we were able to frame our conversations as this is something that we're being asked to do to be in compliance with our federal funder, 
And this approach allowed us to naturally fall into conversations about expenditures without it feeling like we were poking around in places or asking questions uh, that we had never asked before. One example that comes to mind is in conversations with LIAs that had seemingly out of balance expenditures in one category or another. We've since been able to, after completing the HPBAT, take the data and go back to our LIAs and review. And we approach these conversations with the following framing that no one has done anything wrong. We've never evaluated expenses at this level before. And this requirement, this data is offering us an opportunity for, re for reflection. And now that those conversations have begun with our LIAs, we are continuing to have them at a regular cadence. Moving forward, we intend on making the, this an ongoing in-house project that we will be completing annually, um, method methodically tracking various spending, maintaining continued conversations and co uh, collaborations relative to spending with our LIAs. And this will just allow us to quickly determine if and when changes need to be made. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Heather. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of our presenters for the really wonderful information. Um, we appreciate you sharing. So we have some time today for questions. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the chat, uh, but I would just like to encourage you to, to type in any questions that you have. So if you have questions for the Texas team or the Louisiana team, um, I'm sure you're not the only one that's thinking the question. So um, we'd love to take some time for that. Well, I will start with a question, if that's okay. Um, I'll just ask to both awardee teams, um, what surprised you most about this process? I, I can jump in immediately on that one. I think um, where our biggest surprise came from is um, we on our state team thought that we kind of had a clear grasp of all the instructions, all the tabs, um, and kind of what we anticipated in each of those cost categories. Um, and again, because we, um, we do get our LIA budgets and billing on a regular basis. And so we have a lot of familiarity with those numbers. Um, and what we didn't anticipate or the thing that surprised us most is all those different ways that um, individual provider agencies and organizations and their fiscal teams managed to interpret those labor costs and that labor cost mm -hmm. tab. And so um, I think you heard it from me and from Catherine, it's definitely um, where we spent a lot of time and energy clarifying and providing a lot of additional guidance. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Louisiana? Sure, this is Susanna. And I would just echo what Jody just shared. We additionally, um, spent a good bit of time determining the breakdown for uh, labor and, and other costs. And um, we were fortunate to be able to have that interchange with her set after our initial submission and being able to go back and forth and clarify some things in some of the feedback that we received afterwards. Um, but just, uh, I, I would say moving forward, study those sections pretty well and rely on your, um, your support at TARC and, and get some good clarification around where those breakdowns uh, really need to take place because um, we, we had to go back and make some corrections there. Fantastic, thank you for sharing. And it looks like we have some questions coming in through the chat. So um, thanks to everyone who submitted something. I think the first um, couple of questions, I might ask Julie Leith, if you don't mind just sort of speaking to the date of that uh, question about I'm in the third cohort, does that mean the HVBAT will reflect data from October 1st? 2023 to September 30th, 2024. Yep, that's exactly right. That is the, I was just pulling it back up to check the dates again. It's tricky, but that's correct. If you're working on a federal fiscal year, it would be October 1st, 23 to September 30th, 24. And then you would report, Mark. Oh no, I, I apologize. That's not correct. 
it would be October 1st. I might have to write it out for you. Give me a second, Karen, and I'll respond to your message in the chat. It's Thank tricky so even much, for us. Really. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Even though we've looked at it several times, we still have to check our notes. So uh, good plug for looking at the uh, the information as it's listed on the website. <laughs> um, okay, great. So uh, we have a question here about cost per model. Um, how are costs per model calculated for state infrastructure? I'm not sure that may be one we want to come back to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's see. A question from Valerie in Washington. Um, and this could be for either Texas or Louisiana. So about your experience, but Valerie says they have MICFI funded LIA that subcontract, but the subcontracted service does not use any MICFI funds. Um, they have other state and local funding to subcontract for more services. And so the question for the Texas or Louisiana team is, did you have this? And if so, did you require subcontractors to provide HVVAP? And Julie may have something else to add to that as well. This is Susanna from Louisiana, and I'll just go first because this uh, situation unfortunately did not apply to us, or, or fortunately, as the case may be, um, all of our sub awardees um, are MICD funded, and so they had to complete the tools. It was the same in Texas. Um, all of our LIAs and their respective sub awardees utilize MICV funding. Um, so it was pretty universal experience that all of the sub awardees had to complete an HVBAT tool for. Um, for their piece of programming. Um, I will say that a number of our um, LIAs also use some level of match funding, um, just because they get local resources and funding as well to assist with their, their program um, operations and expenses. Um, but that match funding is relatively minimal. And so the majority of the resources and funding they use is McVee. Um, and so they all completed that comprehensive HB, HB bad tool. Fantastic. A uh, question for the Texas team. Um, could you speak to how you had your SATA data converted um, to a usable form to share with your LIAs? So um, I will say that I had less involvement with sort of like the data compilation and aggregation. Um, and we are lucky enough to have Catherine Sibley directing our data team. Um, and so her staff um, were the ones who were able to compile the, the data for our data submission. We have not turned the state data back to LIAs yet. So we haven't yet, because we're still kind of in that process with HRSA of um, kind of almost multiple iterations of making sure that all of um, the, the data is accurate and, and um, has been sort of QA checked. Um, we haven't yet um, kind of synthesized it so that we can um, turn it back out to the LIAs and kind of um, talk to them about what we're seeing across the state yet. Um, that said, we have already had kind of an internal um, annual process for doing that with existing budgets and um, billing submissions throughout the year. And so what we're anticipating is this is going to add to um, that kind of more robust conversation that we have with them every year about budgets, budget planning, um, and then kind of all the things that Sally walked through in terms of how this can be helpful. We're anticipating that um, the data when it's finalized, we can um, integrate that into our annual um, budgeting process that we conduct with all of our grantees. Very helpful. Thank you, Jody. And then we have a question in the chat about Stata. So Jody, you just detailed a little bit of your experience with Stata. Um, I wonder if Louisiana might speak to, to their approach. Uh, sure. Um, I see that our um, data quality manager, Shannon McNabb, is in the chat. And so Great. certainly feel free <laughs> to direct any questions to her. Uh, she took the lead in um, managing all of our, the data portion of HVBAT. And we did use Excel. We did not use Stata. 
So if that helps, she's, like I said, Shannon McNabb is in the chat and I'm sure able to field any questions. Absolutely, I see Shannon's comment in the chat about this data SAS aggregation and that uh, she found it easy to do in Excel um, and that it did not take too long. And I will say that our data team here in Texas also used Excel. Um, so just kind of wanted to point that out too, that even um, as I mentioned, we had a, a really large submission um, with 36 different uh, HVBAT tools and we still used Excel. Okay, that's really helpful. So it looks like we maybe have time for one more question. And so it looks like there's a theme kind of coming up about staff time and allocation of time for this process. And so just wondered if you, either of you might speak to sort of how you handled the time that it took to do this, um, if you have any tips. For, um, for us, it was really an all hands on deck. Um, again, we had uh, a number of, not conflicting, but competing priorities um, happening at, uh, simultaneously. And so um, really our state team, um, we, we just fit this in wherever and however we could um, along with the procurement that we were um, conducting at the, at the same time. And so I will say though that we, we had a work team and um, we met at least once every single week um, with a lot of ad hoc meetings um, just to make sure that we could tackle everything that needed to be tackled in a really timely way. Um, and so it really was a priority for us and our state team. Um, and we really just had to be mindful of making sure that we had time uh, week in and week out throughout the entire process to make sure that we were all on the same page and that we could be giving real time responses to the LIAs as they were completing tools. And this is Suzanne. I would just again echo uh, Jody's comments. You know, um, I think we were a little concerned about the actual conversion um, portion once we got all of our data compiled and um, Shannon, our data and quality manager, knocked it out uh, with a breeze. No, no problem whatsoever. Tiffany certainly had a, a much larger lift uh, with the fiscal component, but certainly uh, the more time you can allow yourself, the better. Um, we, we additionally had some conflicting things like an annual education event and a few other things that all, all seem to happen at the same time. Um, so always err on the side of caution with relative to time. Fantastic, yeah. Definite themes around start early, right? All hands on deck, so we appreciate that. Um, and I've realized that we did not get to all of the questions that came up in the chat. And so we do have a record of those, but I would encourage you if, if you'd like to reach out to your project officer, or your um, TART TA staff, um, they would be happy to continue this conversation with you um, after the webinar today. So. All right, so just some closing thoughts. Uh, before we kind of get into final thoughts, I wanna first share the evaluation link for today's webinar. Um, so no one is kind of scrambling to, to pull that out of the chat in our final moments together. So I do hope to give you a couple of minutes at the end of the call so you can share your thoughts with us. We really do value your feedback it, and we really read through it in detail and, and try to incorporate it into our future webinars. So thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts. Next slide. Okay, here are the deadlines one more time, just for your information. Just a reminder for those awardees in cohorts two and three, that preparation should begin early, but data collection should not begin until the corresponding fiscal year ends. Awardees in cohorts two and three, please reach out to request support from your data and CQI TA specialist if you have any questions or you want support as you prepare for HVBAT data collection and reporting. For those cohort one participants who are joining us on today's call, if you have any additional lessons learned from your HVBAT data collection process that you didn't hear in today's webinar, please feel free to share this in the chat. We would love to hear about your successes and lessons learned as well. Next slide. All right, so we're gonna wrap up our discussion today with three quick polls. So you'll
looks like we have just lost Heather, um, but what she was about to say that we were, we're going to be sharing some polls. So let me share those now and you can follow the link in the chat to cast your vote. So the first question is for all participants today, thinking back on the content we covered today, what actions do you plan to take based on today's webinar? And you can check all that apply. Um, hopefully the text is a little bit larger on your screen, um, but it ranges from I'll share materials, I'll designate an HVBAT project manager within my team. Uh, I know that was one of the best practices that was shared today. I will reach out to our fiscal lead to engage them in this process. My team and I will establish timelines for HVBAT completion, reviews, and revisions. I will meet with my team to discuss how we can use our HVBAT data. So I'm seeing some responses rolling in, looking like there's um, a lot of enthusiasm for some of these ideas. And Heather, I see you're back. So I will um, turn it back over. We still got some results rolling in. So let's just give it another minute as people are kind of deciding what their action steps are going to be. Great. Yes, I'm back. That was unexpected. <laughs> okay, results are slowing down. Are yeah, slowing down. Yeah, so maybe we'll we can move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Okay, already some responses coming in on software. So lots of uh, lots of people thinking about Excel and then uh, some don't know responses, it's understandable. I think responses are slowing down to that one as well, Rachel. Last question, do you have staff who are comfortable using the software and can join your HVBAT team? So it looks like a lot of awardees say yes to that question. A couple of no's and some don't know's. Maybe another good thing to think about as you're sort of getting started with this process. Okay. Looks like that one just about slowing down. Rachel, I think we're good. All right, so next slide. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. If you have additional questions about the HVBAT, please don't hesitate to reach out to your HRSA project officer and your TARP TA team. As always, if you have general questions, you can reach out to us at TARP at edc.org. Thanks a lot and have a really great afternoon.